Here we are, we're gonna talk about oncology. We're gonna talk about our chemotherapeutic agents. So my standard disclaimer for chemo is that one, I don't like chemo very much. Um, I went to fellowship to learn how to use antidotes and how to cure people of poisonings. Chemotherapy is basically poisoning people on purpose, right? With the intent of uh, getting rid of those cancerous cells as we'll, we'll dive into. Um, but this is by no means my, my uh, area of expertise. I still deal with it on a fairly regular basis. So every day when I go into Nemours, I still have to deal with a lot of pediatric oncology. So that's my main experience, right? So I've not really dealt with any adult oncology. Um, I can speak to the drugs, but well beyond that, you know, you may get a different answer. If you talk to a pharmacist who does this full time, and there are pharmacists who do that um, day in and day out, you may, uh, if you talk to an oncologist, you may have a little bit different perspective on things. So I'm teaching from my perspective, and again, uh, that should be the caveat for all my stuff, is that this is just one person's perspective. You can get other flavors if you talk to other people out there, right? Doesn't mean I don't know what I'm talking about. So talk about this stuff, you still need to know it. <laughs> but just know this is not my, my, my main deal. What is cancer besides the astrological sign? Rapid overgrowth, Rapid overgrowth of cells, absolutely. So um, hopefully people who are cancers don't get cancer more often. I wonder if there's a study that looks at that link. Who knows? But um, yeah, basically it's this unchecked cellular growth, right? And so again, this can happen in any particular type of tissue that's out there. Um, some people are going to be more prone to getting one type of cancer versus others. But basically when you get down to it, it's all essentially the same process here. Um, normally, what are some things that inhibit your normal cells from continuing to grow unchecked? Apoptosis. What is apoptosis? Program cell death, right? It's basically the cell saying, hey, I'm too damaged or I don't need to be here anymore. I'm going to go ahead and just off myself, right? So that's apoptosis. What else? What are some other things that prevent your cells from growing? Hmm? You have things like suppressor genes that will prevent from further growth. We have things like contact, um, uh, basically inhibition, where once the cells kind of detect that, hey, I'm being surrounded by all these other cells, I don't need to keep replicating. These are things like that. You lose a lot of that when you have these cancer cells, right? How do you develop these cancer cells? What happens? Mutation. Usually a mutation, right? So usually some sort of mutation happens either due to the smoking or just due to your genetics uh, that you got from your parents or whatever the case may be. Um, and you're going to find there's lots of different reasons for people to get cancer. Uh, you lose that, right? You get that mutation that occurs and they lose um, that contact inhibition. They have altered gene uh, expression or maybe they don't express this P53 gene anymore that usually helps to trigger off apoptosis, all those sorts of things, right? Um, so is to try to, um, one, try to catch it early as we can, right? The fewer cells we have to deal with, the better. Um, and hopefully try to uh, get rid of all those cancer cells as best we can. You have to get rid of every single one of them because if you leave even one left over, there's a potential for the cancer to come back, right? Because again, you just need that one single uh, clonogenic sort of cell and it's going to keep, keep going uh, unless it gets taken care of, right? Either by the host immune system or by something we're going to give the patient exogenously. Anyway, um, right, so it'll undergo this initiation, promotion, then eventual progression. And obviously, you know, it can get much worse depending on how well differentiated the cells are versus what they would normally look like if they start to metastasize and get outside of where they normally uh, are. And so you're going to find that there's just a million different flavors of cancer that are out there, some being very easy to treat, some being very difficult to treat, depending on the case. Some of them are going to be very amenable to things like surgery. Some are going to be better uh, treated with radiation. And a lot of them end up having to get chemotherapy. So that's what we're going to focus on here. So we know there's a lot of different carcinogens out there. One of the big things to note, and uh, just like we talked about with antiarrhythmics, note that any antiarrhythmic can also cause arrhythmias. Just like any chemotherapeutic agent I give these patients, guess what it can cause? Further cancer, right? So again, there's a double-edged sword you have to consider there. Um, you know, would the patient develop that cancer already? Who could say, right? But the, we do know that these drugs tend to be mutagenic, right? They tend to cause mutations in the DNA because a lot of them are attacking the DNA directly, as we'll see. Um, other things we can consider to be known carcinogens, things like anabolic steroids, right? That makes sense because anabolic steroids means they're doing what? They're causing cellular growth hypertrophy. That makes sense. They're stimulating that growth. Of course, they can cause cancer in that sort of standpoint. You know, estrogens can do this, right? People have estrogen-sensitive breast tumors and things like that. Typically, yeah, things, and, androgenic steroids, right? So things like testosterone, DHT, things like that. Yeah, so that could be uh, some, I mean, and, and not just guys at the gym, you know, well, a fair number of females will, will use those as well, right? So uh, it is definitely not a, a gender-specific sort of thing there. These can affect anyone, right? Um, but just know that there's going to be a lot of different substances that are out there. You don't have to memorize this slide specifically, um, but just know that there are many carcinogens that are available. Sometimes the, there are things that we are giving patients on purpose. We know about the risk, but it is one of those things where you can either die from this cancer or have the possible risk of developing other cancer down the road, right? So, 
Um, the thing we're going to be focusing on here is that we're going to be shooting for looking at different targets, right? So some of these um, therapies are going to be focused more on getting rid of just a mass of cells all at one time. So things like surgery uh, can be good for that. We're going to be focusing on things like um, interrupting the replication cycle, either during mitosis itself, or we can do it during things where you're developing new DNA, et cetera, right? So, um, and again, the cells themselves, just like when we give antibiotics, what can happen if you're giving too many antibiotics to a bacteria? They become resistant. Can our, our cells do the same thing? Absolutely, yeah. Those mutations can actually confer some resistance there to where you find certain chemotherapeutic agents are no longer effective and you have to switch over to something else. So again, our human cells are not really all that different than bacterial cells. It's just the process is a little bit different there, right? And remember, what was the nice thing about antibiotics in treating patients with a bacterial infection? Selectivity, right? So again, our hopefully a lot of our drugs are selective for killing off those bacterial cells instead of having to kill off all of our own cells. While we lose a lot of that with especially a lot of our classic sort of chemotherapeutic agents, they can't differentiate between healthy cells and the cancer cells. And so we're going to end up killing a lot of our healthy cells off at the same time. And that's where a lot of toxicity comes from. And most of the drug therapy these patients are getting is not just the chemotherapy, but it's all the supportive medications they need to get in addition to that to deal with the immunosuppression, to deal with the um, mucositis, to deal with the uh, nausea vomiting associated with this. So there's a lot of supportive care that goes into managing these patients. That's an important uh, aspect. So um, some of the principles of therapy, just remember that even a single clonogenic cell can potentially cause that cancer to come back, so you need to kill every single cell whenever possible. Is that always uh, feasible? No, absolutely not, right? It's hard to really detect, oh, there's that one cell, let me get that guy. It's not going to happen that way, right? Um, <clears throat> Different tumors are going to be able to uh, grow and develop differently based off the type of tissue they are, based off of the type of, um, you know, what they respond to. As I mentioned, you, know, you can have uh, breast tumors that are estrogen really sensitive versus some that are less estrogen sensitive, right? And so the therapy uh, and progression of those uh, tumors are going to be a little bit different there. Um, you know, we'll talk about things like localized versus disseminated. You can talk about the, the heterogeneity of the tumor. I say heterogeneity. Anyone know what that means? How kind of uniform the, the cells are, right? Is there multiple different cell types that are involved here? That can make it more difficult for your medications to actually get in and affect all of those cells if it's, you know, maybe uh, more favorable to one type of cell line versus another. If it's very, um, if it's a lot of, uh, very homogenous, you know, it's all the same type of cell that may be a little bit easier to treat as the case may be. Um, there's this uh, thing called Gumpertian cell growth. It's basically just a term talking about how each tumor will have a certain amount of time it takes to double its size, essentially, right? So for all those cells to actually undergo mitosis and, and duplicate itself. Some are very fast-growing tumors. Some can be very slow-growing tumors. In pediatrics, we do with a lot of leukemia. And as you might imagine, you think it's fast or slow growing? Yeah. Very fast, right? Because you're always producing new white blood cells. This is a very, very fast-growing sort of tumor there, right? Um, which means that you have what we call this growth fraction. So what is the fraction of the cells? What percentage of them are in the active growth phase? That's important because you're, what you're going to find is a lot of our chemotherapeutic agents, they tend to be uh, targeting certain cell parts of the cell cycle. So if you go back to your undergrad biology, you remember they talked about the G1 phase and the S phase and all of that. We're going to go back to that because some of our drugs are going to be cell cycle specific. And so if you have a lot of the cells that are actively replicating, then they tend to be more sensitive to the drugs versus if they are kind of stalled out then they're not going to be growing quite as much. So the drugs may be less effective. Okay, so we'll talk about some different strategies, uh, strategies to try to get those cells into that sort of uh, highly uh, quickly replicating sort of mode there. Okay, um, and again, what you're going to find is that typically you're going to find that the uh, the cell growth tends to have a very rapid sort of increase in size, and then it tends to plateau out. And why do you think it plateaus out? Runs out of nutrients, it runs out of room, it can run out of several things, right? So basically it kind of outstrips its own growth, um, and so it tends to flatten out. And that's where you get the uh, lower um, fraction of those cells are actually rapidly you know, dividing, so they can be, make it more difficult for your drugs to actually kick in and work. So here's a picture here where you can kind of see um, how this happens. You see here that when you're dealing with a, a relatively small number of cells, as it starts to grow up, it's going to be very rapid, has lots of nutrients, has lots of good blood supply, has all kinds of uh, room to grow, and then eventually it's going to get to where it's going to start to flatten out. Then basically it's outstripping its own nutrient supply, right? Um, what you see here is even if you were to get, you know, say a 99.9% .9 kill of those cancer cells, that sounds pretty good, right? I got 99.9% .9 of the cells. You still have a fair number of cells that are around here, right? So again, even if I take it down three log units from 10 to the 12th, down to 10 to the, uh, say, the even down to 10 to the 4th, that's still quite a few cells that are around, all of which have the ability to reestablish that tumor again, okay? So that's why it's really important. And what you'll find is that patients will undergo cycles of chemotherapy because you have to make sure you kind of knock it down, give it time to, for the patient to recover, then go back again and hit them again. 
hit them again, hit them again. They'll undergo several cycles to try to make sure they get every single one of those cells to where you have relatively almost none, right? Or maybe the body can kind of go in and, and take care of itself at that point, right? Um, and again, just looking at you know the relative size of the tumors, uh, this should have uh, this should be superscripted here, so it should be 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 9th. Um, you can see you have quite a few number of cells that can uh, you know, make a very large tumor there. Um, so as I mentioned, treatment should be focused on one removing the actual tumor to, uh, itself. So again, with something like leukemia, is that possible? No, it's in the bloodstream; it's going around everywhere. So, but if it's a, a you know well differentiated you know brain tumor. That may be a lot easier to go in with surgery. Maybe not easy, but it's a little bit more feasible to go in and actually excise that out. That's good because once you get that big mass of tumors out, uh, mass of cells out, and then you're going to have some that are still there, right? Some residual ones. Well, now they have a lot more room to grow. They have a lot more nutrients applied. They're going to start to grow very rapidly. So what you're going to find is we use uh, complementary therapies where we may go in with surgery first and then hit them with radiation after or hit them with radiation first and then go in with uh, chemotherapy afterwards, right? So you got to use combinations of therapies here. And obviously, I'm just going to mainly focus on, on the drugs, right? Because that's my, my deal. But typically, you're going to find that these other modalities are going to end up with chemotherapy kind of being the, the um, kind of pulling clean up there. Because again, we can give that systemically and be able to uh, affect all those other cells that maybe have gotten away. Maybe the, the surgeon did not uh, quite get out, whatever the case may be, right? So that's where chemotherapy plays a big role. So as you might imagine, if you have patients who, uh, say, undergo surgery, so they started right here, you can see they would excise a lot of those cells out, right? They would be able to get rid of a ton of those cells, but then you still have a decent number of cells around. Um, you're going to give the patient time to recover. The cell number is going to go up, but then you hit them with chemotherapy. Give them time to recover, and you hit them with chemotherapy, right? Why can't I just keep giving them chemo until all those cells are gone? kill off our patient, right? You don't want to do that, right? So, and a lot of times what you're going to find is that um, it's not necessarily the cancer that kills these patients here or necessarily the chemotherapy, it's the infections they develop afterwards, right? So, again, I can't tell you how many kids I've seen who start off on the hemonc unit getting treated for their particular cancer end up developing either viral infections, fungal infections, they get all kinds of weird stuff because their whole immune system is just wiped out, end up in the PICU, and then they develop, you know, again, hospitals are the worst place to get healthy, right? Because then they have been picking up bugs from other patients potentially, and then they uh, can unfortunately die from that, right? From those infections, because they just have no immune system left over. But again, this is the point where we're going to be using uh, combinations of modalities to try to make sure that we can um, get all those cells, but it takes time. It's going to take several cycles and several different modalities to get to that point. So um, looking at things like drug concentrations, exposure times, the frequency of administration, this is critical to understand for their effectiveness. Um, you have to minimize or maximize the benefit to risk ratio. So again, trying to kill off as many cancer cells as possible while trying to spare as many healthy cells as we can. Now, again, with our traditional chemotherapy, that's very difficult to do. But nowadays, we're starting to get much more specific. And I'll tell you some examples of how we can get very specific to targeting just the cancer cells, getting rid of those, and relatively um, and sparing uh, all the other healthy cells surrounding it, which is kind of a, a nice development in, in this realm here. Um, and as I mentioned, a lot of significant toxicities. A lot of people focus on things like the nausea, vomiting, the alopecia, things like that. But really, it's the immunosuppression is ultimately going to kill these patients here. Right? So um, the dosage regimen, typically we go with high dose, intermittent scheduling. When I say intermittent, what does that mean? Yeah, it's going to be, uh, you'll get it for a period, off, you get it for another period. You know, that could be intermittent, could mean as, uh, as infrequent as, or as frequent as Q8 hour dose and Q6 hour dose, and once you get a dose, nothing, get a dose, nothing. Um, here you can see that maybe several weeks between uh, regimens here, right? Giving patient time to recover their own cells before giving them another uh, bout of, of chemotherapy there. Um, and again, we're going to be looking at the time for maximum susceptibility depends on potentially where the drug acts at in the cell cycle. Is it cell cycle nonspecific? Does it affect just mitosis? Does it affect just the S phase? What, what is it, where is it affecting? And then where is the tumor at in that growth curve? The lower it's at in the growth curve where it's more actively dividing, the more susceptible it tends to be to our chemotherapy. Okay. All right. This is a good slide to refer back to for studying purposes. So you'll get back in, into... Um, uh, looking at the cell cycle and kind of knowing what's going on during the cell cycle and then seeing where the drugs are specifically working. If you know the mechanisms of action of the drug, this will make a lot more sense. And we'll get into that as we go forward. But just for, for our purposes here, um, for instance, you know, what is happening during the S phase? DNA replication, right? So you're going to find there's just several drugs that are working specifically during when the cell is trying to produce new DNA, right? So either they're producing new base pairs, uh, new nucleotides to incorporate into the DNA. That's usually the one of the big ones we're going to do. Um, or we'll actually incorporate false nucleotides. These are kind of masquerading as, as other nucleotides into the DNA to cause, uh, put a kind of a monkey wrench into the, into the machinery there. Um, things like, you know, the M phase, what's happening during the M phase? Yeah. 
actual mitosis, right? So we actually have certain drugs that actually interrupt that process where you actually have that division that actually is occurring there. We can arrest that. And again, anytime you're causing significant, significant enough damage under the cells, you are able to uh, more readily trigger that apoptosis, that cell death, right? And that way the cells will go ahead and say, eh, we don't need to exist anymore. It's going to off our cells, right? And then um, we'll see that there's going to be certain drugs that are going to be non-specific, and you'll get into those, and you'll kind of see why that is the case there, okay? Okay. So as I mentioned, um, you know, G0, G1, not as important for our purposes here. This is where you usually have a lot of protein synthesis. Um, G0, is, I'm sorry, is the resting phase, but G1 and G2 are typically just kind of, you know, developing proteins and things like that. Not, not as important for our purposes here, but the M phase, the S phase, those are the big ones we're going to be targeting with a lot of our drugs. Okay, as I mentioned, um, different parameters here, you have things like the growth fraction, which I already mentioned what that is, um, but you even have things like the S fraction, so what particular percentage of the cells are actually in the, uh, the DNA replication phase, that'll be important for certain drugs there, and then that doubling time is important to note too, so what is, what is the time it takes for that cell line to, to double uh, effectively? And again, shorter doubling time usually means it's a more aggressive tumor, it's more rapidly dividing. Okay, so looking at our dosage regimens, typically we like to go with combination therapy. It's rare that patients are going to get just one um, chemotherapeutic agent at a time. We'll use uh, multiple drugs uh, together in order to get some synergy there, right? So maybe I'll have one that's working on the S phase and one that's working on mitosis, right? Or I'll have one that's in a cell cycle non-specific and the one that affects mitosis, right? By mixing those together, um, you get better cell kill in those cases there. It may help to minimize resistance that develops, and it also helps to minimize some of the toxic effects, as we'll see. Um, and then other adjuvant therapy here, these helps to either treat that toxicity or they help to minimize it if possible. So for instance, antiemetic drugs. We know that um, chemotherapy causes a lot of nausea and vomiting. You need to have antiemetics here. Um, you know, some patients even get what we call anticipatory nausea and vomiting. What do you think that is? Before it happens, right? They know, hey, last time I got that drug, I got so, so sick. And they actually get that nausea and vomiting coming up before they actually go into that. You ever had like a really bad, like, uh, food poisoning or something like that, and you're like, you can't even look at that food anymore without getting nauseous. Same thing happens with those patients, and that's something you have to treat. You treat a little bit differently than you say treat other types of nausea and vomiting. We can get into that a little bit. Um, so again, you have to kind of consider it from, from all aspects there. Um, other things we can do, things to stimulate bone marrow growth. So for instance, if we wipe out their whole immune system, let's give them something to try to stimulate and get it back up into, uh, you know, and, and we'll talk about what we call count-dependent uh, chemotherapy in a little bit later, but oftentimes you have to wait until patients have recovered enough before you can give them more chemotherapy, right? So for instance, you may have to make sure their white count, oftentimes we're looking at their neutrophil count, is high enough and their platelet count is high enough before we give them more chemotherapy. Otherwise, they can run into bleeding risk or they can run into infection risk when they, when they uh, not come down too, too much. As I mentioned, uh, the timing can be important here. Uh, cell cycle specific drugs need to be given when a large percentage of those uh, uh, cells are in that cycle, or uh, part of the cycle there. And then non-cell cycle specific drugs could be given at any time. It doesn't really matter um, because they're going to be affecting um, you know, the different parts of the cell without actually needing to interfere with the actual replication process. And then I mentioned chemotherapy is usually given in cycles, usually a repeating schedule with time in between to allow the patient to recover. Um, and this oftentimes is determined by a lot of clinical trials, okay? And again, is it uh, ethical to have, you know, say 100 people, you get 50 of them, all of them have cancer, 50 of them are gonna give you chemotherapy, you guys no chemotherapy, no. Oftentimes it's not like that, you can't withhold chemotherapy from patients, but you can try different regimens, right? So I can say, okay, well you're gonna get this dose of this particular drug, but I'm gonna give you a different dose. Those studies you can do to try to figure out what are the remission rates, um, you know, what are the cure rates, all the different things, and, and compare to see what is gonna be the best regimen. So um, the vast majority of the studies are the, the kids that get chemotherapy at, in the Moors are on a study, right, because especially in pediatrics, it's very difficult to do studies, right? Uh, we need to figure out what's the best way to treat those kids. And so oftentimes they'll get randomized either getting this particular regimen or they'll get randomized to this regimen. And so, you know, it's never that we're withholding chemotherapy, but those clinical trials help us to determine what's the best way to manage a particular type of cancer. Okay, so this is what we call a roadmap, and this looks pretty complicated, but this is actually what um, most patients who are getting chemotherapy are going to have one of these. And as you can see here, this is a, a part of a, a study here. Um, I'm just trying to see if I can see the study name. I don't see it anywhere. Um, but basically, you're going to find that there's different phases of chemotherapy treatment, whether you're in uh, uh, consolidation, whether you're in maintenance phases, things like that. Um, but this basically will tell you, it gives you the whole roadmap of when they're going to get different chemotherapeutic agents, when they're going to get certain, uh, say, for instance, um, you know, uh, supportive medications, you know, when are they supposed to get them, how much are they supposed to be getting here. And so we follow these pretty religiously to make sure that we are giving the patient exactly what they're supposed to get. Because again, when you're thinking about high-risk medications, chemotherapy is 
one of the highest risk uh, set of drugs you can deal with. So everything has double checks all the way throughout it. So for instance, um, when we uh, the providers are writing orders for chemotherapy, usually we have like a nurse practitioner who write the first order and then the oncologist will come in and do the double signature, right? That's just our process. Uh, we'll have two pharmacists that are going to check it just for the order verification aspect. We have two pharmacists that check it when it's actually made. Then two nurses have to check it before they even give it to the patient. So there's double checks all the way throughout to make sure we don't have any huge errors because some of these drugs, if given incorrectly, can actually be fatal, right? So you have to be really careful with these drugs because, again, they, they are poison, essentially. So as you can imagine here, um, uh, with uh, usually what you, what you find is like with HIV meds and then with uh, cancer meds, they love their acronyms. And so I'm gonna, I'll provide a few of them here. Um, I'm not gonna have you memorize the acronyms for any purpose, uh, but just know that if you work in oncology, you'll kind of get used to this. So for instance, I know if I see CPM, I know the cyclophosphamide. If I see ERA-C, I know that's cytarabine. You know, so if you deal with these uh, drugs on a routine basis, you'll kind of get a feel for it. But you can see here that they'll have the different days. The patients are gonna be getting medications. So you see they'll, right here, they're gonna get a dose of cyclophosphamide. They'll get ERA-C. Uh, which is cytarabine, they'll get mercaptopurine, and they'll also get a dose of IT methotrexate. Let's say IT, anyone know what that means? Interthecal, right? Why would we give drugs interthecally for cancer? It's hard to get across that blood-brain barrier. So if we can provide that into the interthecal space, they're able to uh, go to that protected site and kill off any cancer cells that might be there, right? Um, However, you see it's increasing. You don't get that until later on into the regimen. So just know that you need to follow these roadmaps and it's something that we'll do. And they've designed these based off of previous studies to say, well, yes, we think this is the best way we're going to be able to kill off as many of these cells as we can while keeping the patient relatively uh, you know, alive and, and healthy. Right. Okay. Um, other types of therapy. Some things that we're doing nowadays to try to get more specific for our, our cancer cells. We have things like targeted therapies, where if a cancer cell has a specific mutation, it may be expressing a protein or a receptor that is unique to that particular mutation. If we can target that and be very specific with that, we're going to be able to kill off just those cancer cells and spare everything else. That would be the ideal scenario. We can actually do that in some cases. There are certain drugs you will only get if you have a particular mutation associated with a particular type of cancer. So you're kind of dealing with a subset of subset of patients, but if you do have that mutation, then that's actually the best therapy for you there. Um, so we have things like biologic therapies, uh, things like growth factors that can help with this. We have certain vaccines uh, that can help them manage these cancers here. Anyone know any vaccines that prevent cancer? HPV, HPV yeah, Gardasil is actually uh, shown to prevent cancer, right? Because again, if you prevent the patient from getting HPV, you don't develop that cervical cancer and all the other cancers there. Um, so again, that's kind of the best thing. If we can target those specific therapies or maybe prevent the cancer from occurring in the first place, it's obviously the best. Um, but basically by, by having these targets here, um, you're able to help the own host immune system be able to deal with that. So for instance, if I give you a monoclonal antibody that is targeting a very specific receptor on the cancer cell, then your body can come in, detect that antibody, and then deal with that. It'll then process that cell and get rid of it. Okay, so it's good, uh, helps to limit a lot of that toxicity. Um, for our purposes here, and again, I could spend an entire semester going over chemotherapeutic drugs. I'm not going to do that to you. Um, I'm going to focus on kind of the gold standard, like this is what we use workhorse sort of drugs. Just know there are new biologic agents that are coming out all the time. So there are always going to be new ones. I'll cover just a few of them just to give you uh, an example, but this is more of a survey course of oncology than it is a really big deep dive. Again, because you know, just from the pharmacy perspective, you get a whole specialization just for oncology. Just like I got one for toxicology, they have one just for oncology because it is such an in-depth and um, a very complicated sort of field. Right? Anyway, um, and again, obviously, if we can have early detection, it's always going to be the best thing. The earlier you can catch these, the more treatable they tend to be for the most part. So patient education is always really important. You know, so letting your and ladies know to do breast checks and, and guys know, you know checking the testicles, make sure there's you know, lumps or anything like that. It's always super important to educate them on those things. Okay, and as I mentioned, uh, with our toxicities here, we're going to be killing off rapidly dividing cells. That includes our cancer cells, but also includes a lot of other healthy cells that we need. So, for instance, your bone marrow is going to be affected, right? So, platelet production is going to go down. You're going to be uh, decreasing your white blood cell production. Uh, where else might you get uh, that effect? What else can you see? GI tract can be a big one, right? So, you develop what we call mucositis because all those rapidly dividing epithelial cells are going to start to get killed off. And so you can develop these oral ulcers that make it very difficult for them to intake any uh, nutrition. Take anything by mouth can be very difficult. Um, one other thing to consider as well is that um, things like, you know, when we're worried about infection for these patients, is that what routes of drugs that you can give these patients. And so one of the things you'll find is that, especially with neutropenic patients receiving chemotherapy, you cannot do anything rectally for those patients. Why do you think that is? Right, so if I went to, say, do a rectal temperature, if I were to insert a suppository into that patient there, that tissue, those epithelial cells, it becomes more friable, right? Anyone know what that term friable means? Yeah, it's easier to break up. Like, it's just, it's just, uh, just more fragile, right? And so if you were to have any kind of perforation of that tissue there, 
Well, guess what else lives in the rectum? A whole lot of bacteria, right? So again, if you have any translocation of bacteria into the bloodstream, guess what? Now they have a bloodstream infection they're dealing with. So those are things to consider, right? So if you have a neutropenic patient, can't do rectal temperatures, you can't do uh, any kind of rectal medications, um, those are things that to consider there. So GI tract, uh, GI tract takes a big hit. Um, the hair can also take a hit. Some drugs are more known to cause alopecia than others. So it's not always you're going to see that, but it is a, a kind of a very recognizable thing you think about when you think about chem uh, chemotherapy. And then um, even reproductive cells. Now, a lot of these drugs, um, especially the kind of the, the old school ones we're going to talk about mostly today, um, yeah, they're all teratogenic. They're all mutagenic. So again, you would never want to be giving this to any patient who could be pregnant. But just know that as well that, you know, when you're giving this, you're also going to decrease that reproductive uh, cycle as well. Because again, if you're rapidly trying to develop sperm and you're interrupting that, it's, it's going to inhibit that process. <laughs> Okay. As I mentioned, there's lots of different means for these uh, cells to develop resistance. And actually, a lot of them look very similar to bacteria, right? So they can do things like increase drug efflux. They can change their, their, um, you know, their receptor site mutations. They can do all kinds of things to try to make them more resistant. Um, but just know this is a possibility and that um, usually this is why we use multiple drugs together to help overcome a lot of that resistance. Okay. And then looking at the goals of therapy, right? So are we always treating patients to be curative? We'd like to, but it's not always going to be the case there, right? So we have what we call palliative treatment. And we don't know what that means. We're just trying to like increase their quality of life, not necessarily the quantity of life there, right? So again, we know they may not be able to get rid of that cancer, but trying to make things more comfortable for them um, until the time goes on. So you may sometimes have what we call palliative chemotherapy, where you know it's not going to necessarily save that patient's life, but they make things a little bit more comfortable for them. Okay, so getting into the actual drug, right? This is a non-exhaustive list, but these are kind of the more common ones you're going to run into. Um, and because they're common, you need to know things like the um, uh, the main side effects you're going to run into these. Now, anyone actually interested in going into oncology specifically? Actually, a decent number of you. Um, does that mean the rest of you don't need to know these drugs? You still need another drugs, right? So in case they come in, so if you're working in the ER, if a patient comes in and says, hey, this patient just got a round of um, cytarabine and, and uh, methotrexate and all those other drugs, you need to know what those drugs are, what the potential toxicities uh, are going on with that patient, because that can inform how you manage that patient, what labs are you going to be getting, what uh, sort of workup are you going to be doing for that patient. So you need to know these things, even if you don't deal with them specifically. And again, I hate chemotherapy, but I still need to know a lot about it in order to make sure I'm managing those patients at, at Nemours, right? Okay, um, so the first thing we're going to be looking at, what we call our anti-metabolites. These are going to be drugs that are going to be working specifically on the production of DNA. Okay, so if you had to guess, which phase of the cell cycle they're going to work on? Mainly the S phase, right? When you're actually producing the new DNA itself, right? So we're going to find that there are some things that will deal with the synthesis of the actual uh, nucleotides that get incorporated into the DNA. Some of them are going to actually get incorporated into the DNA themselves. And we're going to see what kind of damage that can cause as you go along. So, um, and again, if I, if on any of these slides, there's drugs that we don't talk about specifically, you don't need to know those. If, on the actual slides themselves, I'll cover the drugs that you're going to be responsible for, just FYI. Uh, so we'll get into these, but you can refer back to the slide later. So as I mentioned, um, the anti-metabolites tend to be similar in structure to DNA and RNA. Some of them will either interrupt the actual synthesis of the nucleotides or they will, as I mentioned, get incorporated into the DNA or the RNA. The, what you're going to find is that once it gets incorporated into that DNA, they usually have some kind of modification done to them to where the actual cell cannot continue to elongate that any further. So again, if you have DNAs being made and all of a sudden you get to this, what we call a chain terminator, where the chain can't elongate any further, guess what? That DNA is cooked at that point. The cell says, well, we, don't, we can't produce any more DNA. We're just going to go ahead and kill off the cell. So the trick is, is to trigger apoptosis in these cells by causing enough DNA damage uh, during the synthesis aspect. Okay. We have a couple different categories here. And again, these are non-selective, so they're going to be working for both healthy cells and cancer cells, as you'll see. Um, we're going to have what we call pyrimidine analogs, purine analogs. And again, that just goes back to the chemical structure in which nucleotides are going to be subbing for. And then we'll also have what we call our folate antagonist. Folate antagonists are going to come up over and over again. Uh, that's where our methotrexate falls into play. But we'll talk about that in, in rheumatology as well. So first ones we have here is going to be our pyrimidine analogs, right? So this is where we're going to find, um, here's an example of cytidine, what the normal nucleotide looks like. And then we have cytosine arabinoside, or ARAC, this is um, uh, cytarabine, is one of our drugs here. And so what you notice here, what's the kind of the difference in the structure between the normal and the drug? It just flips the position of this hydroxyl group. That's enough to 
fool the cell to incorporate into the DNA, but once it's there, it actually can't elongate any further. It can't add any more nucleotides to that. And so it tricks the cell enough to be like, oh, wait a second, we, we got this here, we got a new you know, you know, a monkey wrench in the system, let's go ahead and just scrap this whole cell and get rid of it. It's essentially what we're doing here. So cytarabine is a very common one we're going to have here. It's a cytidine analog. I don't care that you know specifically which uh, base pair it's subbing in for, but just be familiar with the drug knowing, okay, that's an anti-metabolite. I know that's the one that um, gets incorporated into the DNA and then it can't elongate any further. That's kind of the level I'm shooting for here uh, for your, our purposes. Um, and again, don't need to know uh, specifically what types of tumors it treats. Again, I'm focusing mainly on what their mechanism is, what the interactions are, what the toxicities are. I don't care if you know it works for non-small cell lung cancer versus uh, even I don't know all that stuff, right? I know what I treat mainly with I do a lot of leukemias. I know what drugs we use most often. But again, you know, um, if you work in that field, you'll get used to that. You'll know all that stuff. I want you to at least be familiar with the drugs uh, in and of themselves, okay? Um, Anyway, this is one you commonly give intravenous. It could be also used intrathecally, so see a few agents we use that way. Um, and we use it quite frequently for treating a lot of different types of leukemia here. Now, um, toxicities you're going to find here. Um, a lot of these are going to have uh, very similar toxicities because they're doing a lot of similar activities to block that reproduction of those cells. So, for instance, here we have dose-limiting leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. Right? That means that you're going to be knocking down those uh, rapidly dividing hemopoietic cells. And so you can develop thrombocytopenia, you can develop neutropenia. Neutropenia is going to lead to, potentially, infection, good, and then thrombocytopenia can lead to bleeding, right? So you got to make sure that this is one of those drugs that tends to be count-dependent, meaning we're going to do labs on the patient to make sure they've recovered enough before we actually give them more drug, right? So we shoot for certain neutrophil counts, that's where you use uh, absolute neutrophil counts uh, when you're uh, measuring those. What does it mean by dose limit? Like, how much dose you're getting? Yeah, so for instance, we'll have kids that will come in, and this is kind of... Uh, Kind of stinks for the for the kids, but say uh, you know parents take off time work, they bring them in and they get their labs done, and it turns out oh actually your neutrophils haven't recovered yet. We can't give you chemotherapy today. Try again next week. So they can't get another dose until they've actually recovered enough. So that's a very dose limiting from that standpoint. You said before that um, the cancer can be resistant. Yeah, so just like we think about antibiotics, like you want to give the full treatment course, you don't want to like cut it short or delay it or anything like that. So I certainly I think a valid concern, um, but it's a it's a double-edged sword, right? The risk versus benefits. I need that patient to recover because otherwise, if they get an infection and they end up in the ICU, that's going to be much more deleterious to them than if they, if they had waited to say another week or so to um, get that chemotherapy, right? Um, so yeah, that's definitely weighing, weighing the risk versus benefits there, and it's better to wait for the patient to recover uh, their their cell uh, their lymphoidic cell line for sure. Yeah, good question though. Um, is this why um, you have to give them that shot, like maybe like a week post treatment, in order to prevent the leukopenia and the thrombocytopenia? Well? Which shot? I forgot the name of the shot. It's like a kind of like a bone marrow type of stimulant. Yeah, so sometimes, we'll, yeah, so we have the things called uh, colony stimulating factors. I'll, I'll mention them briefly a little bit later on. Um, but yeah, sometimes you'll wait a little bit because, again, you don't want to necessarily stimulate. The cancer cells to grow again, you know you're going to get some of them are going to be stimulated, but um, you may wait a little bit. So certain regimens will say, hey, you know, give this, say, 24 hours after. You may say give seven days after, and that way it will help to stimulate that cell line to, to re repopulate itself, essentially, uh, and that way they can get another dose of chemo, you know, that much sooner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes we'll do that for sure. Yeah. Um, other things, nausea, vomiting, mucositis. Now, you're going to find that um, all these chemotherapeutic drugs, guess what? They all cause nausea, vomiting, right? That probably goes for any drug out there. These tend to be much more severe in a lot of cases. Now, that's all on the spectrum, right? So, in fact, most places you work, if you deal with chemotherapy, it will have what they call anti-emetic guidelines, and you'll find that different drugs have different emetogenic potential, right? So, emetogenic just means it causes nausea, vomiting. Um, so, certain things will have a very high Emetogenicity, some things will have relatively low emetogenicity, right? Um, but again, anytime these patients are getting chemo, usually they're going to have at least one antiemetic on their on their MAR, right? They're going to have at least one antiemetic on the order written for to at least get that to hopefully prevent any nausea and vomiting from occurring, right? Does anyone actually like to throw up? No, it's terrible, right? It's a horrible one from a quality of life standpoint, but also just from a nutrition standpoint, um, you know, microaspiration of uh, any, any bacteria, things like that, like it can be bad for the patients. That's why we like to prevent that if at all possible. I've never had anyone actually raise their hand. If I do find that person, I'm going to be slightly concerned. <laughs> but um, other things you can see. So uh, one of the things to note here is you got to watch renal function um, with cytarabine because you can develop what we call the cerebellar syndrome. And you see this in a lot more larger doses. Uh, we develop this kind of uh, neurotoxicity where this nystagmus, ataxia seen with a dysarthria. Uh, so it would be one kind of unique thing to know about cytarabine there.
And then also uh, other cells that might be affected as well could be like within the eye, the epithelial cells there can be taking a hit. And so oftentimes you may need um, things like steroid eye drops. Sometimes you'll have to use some additional, you know, lubricants to make sure they, uh, you know, don't develop any kind of keratitis there. Uh, another one is called gemcitabine. Here you can see how they took off those hydroxyl groups and actually put two fluorine molecules there. So that definitely kind of tri uh, trips up uh, the cell and it cannot elongate any further off of that. So again, the same mechanism, it just has a little bit different chemical structure there. And so again, this one's uh, stru structurally related to cytarabine doing the same thing, um, but again, just with a little bit different flavor of it. Again, toxicity is going to be very, very similar here as well, right? We're going to see the myelosuppression, the GI uh, hits, all those sort of things. Now, some of these can cause a little bit of a, an immune reaction in and of themselves and have kind of like flu-like sort of syndrome, in which case you can just treat that supportively. Just give them some Tylenol, and that usually helps to mitigate a little bit of the fever and arthritis that come about from that. Now, this one is not necessarily getting incorporated into the DNA, but this actually prevents the production of the, uh, the new uh, nucleotides here. So this one's called 5-fluorouracil, or 5-FU. If you ever don't like your patients, but hey, 5-FU, buddy. Um, <laughs> But basically what you're going to find is this is the process here. We're going to find that um, thymidine is actually produced, right? So you're going to find that there's different um, intermediary steps here. And if you notice MTX, that's going to stand for methotrexate. That's going to come up in a second here. Um, but 5-4-uracil is basically inhibiting the thymidylate synthase, right? So by incorporating or by inhibiting that process, you can't produce new thymidine. So now you have less base pairs actually being incorporated into the DNA and also in the RNA there, right? And so by doing that, it's going to be uh, screwing up the process. It's not going to be able to replicate the DNA effectively, thus it triggers off apoptosis, right? So again, this is doing it a little bit earlier in the process rather than getting it incorporated to the DNA itself. Now again, do you think this would also be S-cycle specific? Mm -hmm. This would be, all right, because again, it's affecting the replication of the DNA itself, right? So if you can't produce the new DNA, you can't replicate it, right? So again, that's still S-cycle specific there, or uh, S-phase specific. Again, very similar toxicities here. Again, there's another one where you can see that cerebellar syndrome. Um, another thing you may see occasionally is what we call hand-foot syndrome. Anyone ever heard of that? It basically it's a peripheral neuropathy that develops. Like, it's kind of you know it's kind of neuropathic pains, like tingling, shooting sort of pains there. Uh, but it tends to be affecting those really distal uh, neurons, and so the the hands and the feet typically get affected uh, more uh, preferentially than something a little bit more centrally uh, located, right? So something you can see, and there'll be a few of these drugs that will do that. Uh, moving on, next we have our purine analog. So this is a very common one we use a lot in our pediatric patients called 6-mercaptopurine or 6-MP if you ever see that. And another one called thioguanine. They're essentially doing the same thing here. So instead of incorporating and, and affecting um, uh, the pyrimidine synthesis, is working on the purine uh, aspects here. So they'll get incorporated into the DNA and again prevent that chain uh, elongation there. So the same mechanism as something like cytarabine, it's just working on a different um, aspect. So the pyrimidine is affecting the purines there, right? Um, Again, looking at this, you can find the hepatotoxicity is a common thing you're going to find with 6MP, so you have to monitor your LFTs. And what's actually interesting here is that some patients are going to be more genetically predisposed to toxicity than others, right? Those are pharmacogenetic differences. Um, so you may find that based on enzyme expression can actually lead to that worse uh, toxicity there. So you have to be kind of careful with that. It's hard to determine which patients may develop that, but if you see that they tend to do worse with something like 6MP, then it would lead you to believe that, yes, they probably have that mutation there that leads them to the more toxicity. Uh, and then we have our folate antagonist. So the methotrexate is going to be the big one here. You're going to see this drug pop up a lot when we come, uh, talk about rheumatology. Um, and again, a lot of times you're going to find that the dose makes all the difference in, as far as your indication goes. Typically for something like a folic antagonist uh, like methotrexate for cancer, you're going to be given really big doses, right? Because you want to wipe out all of those cancer cells versus if I was using it for something uh, where I just need sort of a mild uh, anti-inflammatory immunosuppression like with rheumatoid arthritis, you use a lot lower doses, right? So you're going to find the dosing regimens uh, are going to be a lot different. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, so basically what you're going to find is that this is going to be um, inhibiting the process of utilizing folic acid to produce our nucleotides like thymidine. You can see here this is going to be a, a dihydrofolate reductase antagonist. So basically it's inhibiting this enzyme here so you can't convert this dihydrofolate into tetrahydrofolate. All you need to know is it's uh, blocking the activity of folic acid. You cannot utilize the folic acid to make those nucleotides and thus you're inhibiting that DNA synthesis. Right? That's kind of the level we need to know here. Um, and so again, very similar to the 5-FU, which is working on a different step of the process. You can kind of think about the mechanisms uh, quite similarly there. Um, this one we use, this is a, a big workhorse sort of um, uh, chemotherapeutic drug. Um, sometimes patients will be on it daily, say orally, uh, at home. Sometimes they're going to come into the infusion center to get IV. And actually, we give this one uh, intrathecally quite frequently as well.
Now this one's unique uh, because it does actually have some antidotes associated with it. So again, just like we talked about with the um, say anticoagulants, if there's an antidote associated with it, you want to know what those are, right? Because again, you may need to administer those uh, depending on, on what the case may be. And so, uh, you know, again, toxicity here is going to be very similar to a lot of the other chemotherapeutic drugs. This one's also known for causing some hepatotoxicity. And then another thing we'll see is some renal toxicity. Now, these cell is not directly affecting the renal cells themselves, but what can actually happen is a methotrexate, if it's in a more, uh, say, acidic environment or the patient's dehydrated, it tends to crystallize out. So if it precipitates out in the renal tubules, that can cause damage to the cells there. So this is why uh, you want to make sure your patients are well hydrated when they're getting methotrexate, and then you need to make sure uh, that occasionally we'll actually give them uh, sodium bicarb, and it's going to help to alkalinize the urine and prevent that precipitation from occurring. Okay? So... Um, so the other thing is, well, imagine, like, what if I were to have a patient say they accidentally got too much methotrexate? I know it's inhibiting utilization of folic acid. How could I fix that? Could I give them more folic acid? Well, I couldn't do that, right? Because, again, it's being inhibited. I can't utilize that folic acid. But, however, what if I can give the activated form? That would actually bypass that whole step there. And so this is why we have a drug called leucovorin or folinic acid. So folinic acid is the activated form of folic acid. By giving that it kind of, uh, you know, circumvents the activity of methotrexate, and those cells can then use that. And so oftentimes what we'll have is what we call a leucovorin rescue, where we'll give patients a really big dose of methotrexate to try to affect all those cancer cells. You know, it's going to affect all their healthy cells as well. And then afterwards, we'll give them this leucovorin to try to help recover those healthy cells as best you can. Right. Uh, so you may see they'll get a big dose of methotrexate and say eight hours later, 24 hours later, they'll get a dose of leucovorin and to help try to recover as many of those healthy cells as they can. So that's something you might see there. And then uh, one final uh, antidote we have with this one is called glucarpidase or viraxase. This is actually used very, very rarely, but if you ever had a patient who say may had an accidental overdose or they're having such severe toxicity from methotrexate, um, this is actually a, an enzyme that will go and actually directly cleave the methotrexate and immediately get rid of it. Um, and so by doing this, uh, it's able to, to basically deal with the threat immediately and, and pretty, pretty well. But however, it's very, very expensive. I think it, uh, the last time we gave a dose of Viraxase, I think it was like something like $100,000 just for one dose. So it's very, very going to be very judicious when, when you decide to use it. Yeah, so just be aware of the antidotes, know what we would give. Actually, I remember um, I had a, a case one time where um, I was on rounds of the fellow of the year ahead of me was taking call, and he had someone who accidentally had too much methotrexate um, taken. Uh, they are taking for rheumatoid arthritis, but they had accidentally uh, given themselves too much. Um, and so he was like, okay, we'll go ahead and just give this much folic acid. And he got off the phone, and the attending was like, what did you tell me to give? He's like, folic acid. And he's like, are you sure about that? And he's like, oh, no. So there's nothing worse than having to call someone back up. You just give him all these recommendations. You sound like such a big expert, and then have to go with your tail between your legs. He's like, actually, I meant to say this instead of this. Feels kind of silly, but you know, ultimately it's better for the patient, right? There's no folinic acid, not folic acid for this. Yes, ma'am. If you're That's the thing, yeah. So again, it's that it's a double-edged sword where you're going to have some of those cancer cells may still get a little bit of benefit from that leucovorin, um, but ideally, what you're going to find is that. Um, you're preferentially affecting cells that are more in that S phase, right? That are more in that rapidly dividing phase. A lot of your healthy cells don't necessarily need to be in that rapidly dividing sort of phase, it, right? Because again, a lot of them are just, you know, happy just chilling out in the G zero phase. They still need that folic acid. They still need that activity there. So uh, what you find is that the uh, cancer cells are going to preferentially take that hit. They're going to get more of that methotrexate effect get killed off. And then by the time you get the leucovorin, hopefully some of those healthy cells are going to be able to uptake that and get that benefit there. So again, yes, probably some of those cancer cells are going to get some benefit. But um, again, looking at the numbers overall, you're going to be getting rid of a lot of the cancer cells much more so than you'll be helping them out, essentially. Good question, though. Okay, so any questions on the anti-metabolites? It's kind of the first group we're going to cover here. I'm going to go and give you a 10-minute break. We'll come back and then start to get through the rest of these. Questions from the first half? <coughs> Anyone, anyone? All right, let's continue moving on. So we talked about our anti-metabolites that are affecting DNA synthesis. Now we're moving into our microtubule targeting drugs. What are microtubules? Slides smaller than macrotubules. They pull apart the chromosomes, right? What else do they do? They're like the skeleton of the cell, right? They provide this, the, the structure, right? The main thing we're going to focus on, and you're right, though, is, is the mitosis aspects of it, right? Those microtubules are really good for pulling those chromosomes apart during uh, those, that last phase, right? Um, so basically, uh, we're going to find a couple of different classes of drugs here. And again, 
if it's working on the microtubules, what phase of the cell cycle do you think it's working on? The M phase, right? So that makes sense there, okay? Uh, so we're going to have a couple of different classes here. We're going to have our taxanes, and we're also going to have our vinca alkaloids, okay? So uh, anyone know what type of plant that is, what type of tree that is? I, just, I always like to point out, like, the plants that, like, certain drugs come from, because I kind of like that, that aspect of it. You know, we still have some natural, you know, I like natural medicine, man. Like, this is natural medicine. You know, it comes from a natural source, right? Uh, it's still poison, but it comes from a natural source, you know? Cyanide comes from apple seeds, you know, there you go. Um, so anyway, so this is actually a yew tree, a Y-E-W tree, not a me tree, but a yew tree. Um, and so this is uh, where we get our taxanes, okay? So we're going to have two drugs in this class called paclitaxel and then docetaxel. Basically, what these are going to do is they, and again, this is a little different than the vinca alkaloids. We're going to find that these are going to be working on the, uh, they help to promote the formation of the microtubules, but they prevent the breakdown, right? So you can actually form them to try to pull those chromosomes apart, but then they can't actually cause any breakdown to occur. So you're kind of stuck in that very last aspect of mitosis. Once you're stuck there, the cell tr figures out, that, hey, something's gone wrong here. Let's just go ahead and scrap the cell unless you trigger apoptosis here again, right? So basically, these really functional, are these very uh, structurally sound, but not very functional microtubules that cannot be broken down there. Now, things to note here, some of the toxicities, again, mild suppression for both, that's not anything new we've encountered, um, but some interesting ones here, docetaxel tends to cause fluid retention. Who might that be bad for? Yeah. CHF patients, absolutely, or patients maybe with renal dysfunction, right? They may not be good to hold on to that extra fluid. So that is something that's unique to docetaxel. And then paclitaxel tends to cause neurotoxicity, okay? So basically by causing uh, these peripheral neuropathies, you also tend to get that hand-foot sort of distribution, that stocking-glove sort of distribution. You may hear called that as well, um, where those really uh, distal sort of nerve endings are getting affected there. It's that neuropathic sort of pain, sort of shooting, tingling kind of uh, burning sort of sensation there. And also you can see some hypersensitivity. So with this one, you want to make sure you have medication on on the MAR, on the orders already written, uh, in case they have a reaction to it, right? So what kind of drugs would you want to have in case a patient has an allergic reaction? Epinephrine? Epinephrine. Epinephrine. Steroids. steroids. Like, what kind of steroids? Dexamethasone is a good one. What else? Methyl, methylprednisolone, right? These would be IV agents you'd want to use, like methylprednisolone would be a good option there. And what else? Antihistamines like? Yeah, diphenhydramine would be the, the go-to sort of antihistamine there, right? So that three-drug regimen you want to make sure you have on there. You know, you say PRN on call in case they have an anaphylactic reaction, but you want to have it there so that way if they do have a reaction, the nurse can respond to that immediately, okay? So again, these are these ancillary sort of orders you need to think about having on the chart to make sure that the nurse can respond accordingly, okay? Because you don't want them to have a reaction. The nurse has to call you up, hey, patient, uh, it's starting to sound, I have a little bit of strider, and they're not really breathing too well. Uh, can I come in and order for us some epi? You don't want to be in that situation, right? You want to have it on the chart already ready to go. So anyway, um, and again, oftentimes we'll pre-treat patients if we know they're going to have a history of a reaction to it, you know, if they get, maybe get some pruritus associated with it, some rash, we'll pre-treat them. We'll give them corticosteroids beforehand to try to help to mitigate that and limit some of those side effects. You may see that occasionally where they'll get a dose of, say, for instance, methylprednisolone before they get the drug and they'll have another order for methylpred that will be on call in case they have an allergic reaction, right? So that's um, useful to have uh, both uh, sets of orders potentially. On the other hand, anyone know what type of plant this is? the periwinkle plant. So uh, this is where we actually get our vinca alkaloids from. Um, if you ever go to like the Lou Gardens, I think it's kind of fun going around, kind of showing off all the different like poisonous plants. Like you don't want to eat this one because this will cause this type of toxicity. You don't want to eat this one. Basically don't eat plants. Uh, <laughs> unsolicited, I would just recommend against it. But a um, couple of different drugs that fall into this category. We have vincristine, we have vinblastine, and then vinarelvine. Now some of you are probably too young to know uh, what the VCR uh, acronym usually means, right? Most of you guys probably grew up with DVDs. Yeah, okay. Um, just messing with you. I always feel starting to age you guys out a little bit every year. It's a little worse. But yeah, so VCR, if you ever see that, it's usually standing for, for vincristine. You have vinblastine and vinarelbine. Um, these are going to be more focusing on um, actually disrupting the formation of the microtubules. So if you can't form the microtubules to pull those chromosomes apart, you again arrest mitosis. Okay. Now, typically, you would not want to combine both, say, for instance, paclitaxel plus uh, vin uh, vinca alkaloid, but you'll find that um, oftentimes regimens will be where you'll have one that's working on the M phase and one working on the S phase, and that's how you're going to combine them. Um, very similar to if you were to, say, for instance, give combination antibiotics you wouldn't want to give two, um, you, know, you wouldn't want to give a cephalosporin and a penicillin, even though they're kind of working, they have the same mechanism essentially, you kind of wouldn't want to combine those, but I would want to do an aminoglycoside plus a carbapenem or something like that, right? So again, you get better synergy that way. Now, um, this is a unique one because this is actually fatal if given intrathecally, 
You may think, well, who would accidentally ever give a drug intrathecally? Well, I, I, you got to be pretty, pretty bad to accidentally trip up and accidentally stab a patient in the spine, right? But it could happen, right? Because you imagine, we saw on that roadmap before that patients get multiple drugs at the same time. So there are a lot of times where a patient will be getting intrathecal methotrexate plus vincristine. And if you were to screw that up accidentally and give vincristine by the wrong route, and again, if we have a big warning like this, guess what? Someone's probably done it before. That's why we have to make that big warning there. And so we do a lot of things to try to prevent those errors. So for instance, we have all those double checks we have on there. And also, for instance, if you're giving a drug intrathecally, it needs to be given in a syringe. Well, we never put vincristine in a syringe. We only ever put it into a, like a, those plastic bags um, and infuse it that way. So that way, there's no chance that someone's going to accidentally give that intrathecally. So again, there's a lot of safety processes in place to make sure we don't do something like this and cause a big uh, boo-boo. Um, you ever heard of a sentinel event? This would be an example of a sentinel event where you cause serious harm or death to a patient. Um, you never want to be involved in a sentinel event if you can uh, avoid it, for sure. Um, anyway, so other things you're going to find with these is that vincristine typically does cause um, this neurotoxicity. So you can see this uh, hand foot syndrome again, like we mentioned with some of the other agents. Um, but it's also interesting is you can cause this paralytic ileus and constipation. So we actually have one patient who um, we have to monitor for their the, for constipation because we do know they have a, a history of that. So we have to make sure their, their bowels are moving okay, they have good bowel sounds before we'll give another dose of vincristine because we do know that can be a, a risk for that patient there. And then also these tend to be vesicants. Anyone know what a vesicant is? Hmm? Cause vesicles, yeah. So basically, these are going to be drugs that are extremely irritating if they get into the skin, essentially, right? So again, why would they ever get into the skin? Well, you infuse into a vein, but what happens if you go outside of that vein? What do you call that? Extravasation, right? So if you extravasate these drugs here, they get into the surrounding tissue and then cause very severe tissue damage there, right? So we call that uh, the cause of vesicants. We'll talk about several other ones that are vesicants as well. Um, again, you're going to find that treatment can vary depending on the type of drug. Sometimes we're going to give them, uh, like, say, warm heat, and that way uh, that will help to, I guess you can't have cold heat, but we'll give them heat to help disperse the drugs so it absorbs more quickly. Sometimes we'll apply cold. Sometimes we'll apply certain um, uh, other medications to try to get rid of that drug. Uh, so be very careful with that. I'm not going to go over all that, but just any hospital you work at, you'll see that there's usually uh, an extra... Uh, extravasation guidelines and they'll tell you exactly what to do if you ever extravasate one of these drugs. But that's why you always want to make sure and double check you have good IV access, good flow um, before you ever give one of these, right? It's important to know about that. It just give you an idea just at where these different targets are working at. So here's an example, a couple different microtubules. You can see where the vincristine and the, the vinca alkaloids are going to be working at versus something like the, the, the taxanes. Um, and then also when we get into talking about gout, anyone ever heard of the drug colchicine? Colchicine actually works on the microtubules as well. So again, there's different targets where they can work at, which is why you see the, for instance, the, the, the alkaloid, the vinca alkaloids are working on the formation, whereas the taxines can work on the uh, preventing the breakdown of the microtubules. Okay. Anyway, uh, moving on, next we have what we call our topoisomerase inhibitors. Have you ever heard of topoisomerase before? Where did we talk about those previously? Fluoroquinolones, right? So now we're starting to see that you can actually have certain drugs that are going to be specific for humans by shooting for the same enzymes, essentially, but for the different flavor of it, right? So uh, we saw the fluoroquinolones work for the bacterial topoisomerase. These drugs are going to work for the topoisomerase present in humans, essentially. Um, and so what does topoisomerase normally do? So, yes, yeah, so, so what is it? But what does the actual enzyme do itself? It helps with the unwinding of the DNA, right? So that way you can have it split up and that way you have other enzymes come in, you know, DNA polymerase and all that sort of stuff. Um, so what you're going to find is that topoisomerase 1 and 2 either cause uh, a single strand break or they cause double strand breaks. And so what happens if I were to inhibit those enzymes? Yeah, so either you can't reestablish those breaks and try to rewind the DNA, or you increase the number of strain breaks you have there because you can't reseal them, and thus more DNA damage by, by strain breaks means you're more likely to trigger that apoptosis, okay? So again, this is going to be a little bit less cycle-specific because it can just go in through and, and affect that DNA in kind of at any point there. So um, what you're going to find is that uh, some drugs are going to work more specific on topo some are one, some are going to work more on two. I'm not going to get that specific with it, so don't worry too much about that. Just know which ones fall into that category. And so we have three that fall in, into this category. We have the epidophilotoxins. It's kind of a mouthful. I'll show you some drugs that fall into that. Uh, we have the anthracyclins and then the camptothecans. So the epidophilotoxins includes atopicide and tenipicide. It's actually the, the may apple plant. Uh, in case anyone uh, could not identify that via site alone. Um, but basically, these are going to be inhibiting uh, topoisomerase 2, 
they actually work a little bit to inhibit uh, microtuber formation as well. Uh, and, and what you're going to find with these ones, that these tend to be a little bit more severe for causing the alopecia, they tend to be a little bit more common with epidophila toxins. Um, but again, pretty severe nausea, vomiting, dose limiting mild suppression, that's nothing new we haven't seen already with some of these other drugs here. The anthracyclines, these ones are actually pretty unique uh, in some of the toxicity they have here. So we have a few uh, agents that fall into this category. We have doxorubicin, we have donorubicin, and then mitoxantrone. Again, these are going to be inhibiting topoisomerase as well, in addition to the fact that it can, what we call, intercalate with the DNA. I don't know what intercalate means. Basically kind of just jams itself into the DNA. So you imagine your DNA strands, you can just jam itself right in between there and cause significant damage, right? By changing the formation of the DNA, the, the actual, the actual uh, structure of it, um, you're able to cause pretty significant damage there. Here's a picture. You can notice here that do doxorubicin, notice how there's a very kind of planar sort of structure there with those four rings. Uh, basically, you can just go ahead and insert itself into the DNA. And by causing that change there, you're just kind of disrupting the base pairs from interacting with one another. It causes that damage. And also, you're inhibiting topoisomerase as well. Uh, that can lead to DNA damage and lead to eventual cell death. Okay, so these are very potent drugs, but we're going to see some interesting uh, toxicities that develop from it due to the fact that it has a free radical production. And free radical just means what? It's an oxygen with just one free electron. It's very, very reactive. It interacts with a lot of different proteins, can denature them. Very, very dangerous molecule. And what do we give to deal with free radicals? Antioxidants. Yeah, you can actually have antioxidants to help to, to neutralize those. And notice here what color this is. If you ever see a big red bag uh, of uh, being hung on a patient, that's typically doxorubicin or donorubicin. So I like to note that drugs have a very particular color to them. That's, that's one of them. So the toxicity here, um, the unique one you're going to see with this is the cardiomyopathy and potential development of CHF. And so this is actually a group of drugs that have a lifetime max dose that you can receive. It's kind of a unique thing. We haven't heard of a drug before that gives you, you only get so much in your entire lifetime and then you can't receive it ever again. And that's because of the cardiac toxicity here. Basically, the cardiac tissue has a, a lesser ability than some of your other cells to deal with those free radicals. So when you have the free radicals forming, it's going to go through and start to damage all those uh, tissues and all that muscle in the, in the uh, myocardium. It's going to eventually lead to that CHF and that cardiomyopathy that develops there. So what kind of monitoring would you want to do for that patient? You want to do echoes for them, right? So you usually get one at baseline, and you do follow-up echoes as well to make sure they're not developing that cardiomyopathy there. And also, you never want to exceed that lifetime max dose. Now, I mentioned um, uh, whenever you have antidotes, you want to be familiar with those. This is one that does have an antidote. This one is called dextrazoxane. This is actually a chelator that helps to chelate iron, and iron is very important for helping to generate those free radicals. By doing that, it helps to uh, be a, what we call a cardioprotective sort of agent. So it actually will give you a larger lifetime max dose that those patients can receive. Um, uh, over the you know the course of treatment there, so that can be very useful there. Now, for instance, if I had a patient say maybe had not hit that lifetime max dose, but I did an echo, and then all of a sudden I see that yeah, the heart's starting to get a little bit bigger than it was before. You know, do you necessarily want to continue treatment? Oftentimes you won't, right? So once you say that, okay, they have too significant toxicity, then you switch them over to something else potentially, right? There may not be a lot of good options, but again, you want to save the heart uh, if possible. Um, other things you're going to see with this, they are very strong vesicants. So you have to be really careful with these. Make sure they don't extravasate. And then, obviously, it's going to cause some red discoloration of urine, sweat, all sorts of things are going to be uh, very well discolored. Um, now, one thing to consider there, if you give chemotherapy to uh, uh, you know, a patient, who else do you have to consider uh, might be exposed to that chemotherapy? Nurse. The caregivers might be around there, right? So you got to be careful of that. Nurses are probably the one, they're the frontline fighters there, right? So they're going to be the ones most likely to be exposed. Now, is it just the chemotherapy they're giving to the patient that they have to worry about? Think about their excretions as well, right? So think about things like, you know, if you're dealing with kids and they have a, a diaper, you know, a soiled diaper. Think about, you know, the blood that they're having to pull. You know, think of all these things. They can be contaminated with this chemotherapeutic stuff for a good period of time. So PPE is super, super important for healthcare providers. Make sure they're, you know, gloving up like they're supposed to. Make sure they're not giving themselves any unnecessary risk. So again, it's triadogenic. So if you have a pregnant patient, or a pregnant nurse, that could be a problem. Uh, if they have any chance for becoming pregnant, you know, they could develop cancer or secondary to this, so they want to make sure they use proper PPE. So just one thing to consider. Anywho, um, right, so Zinicard or dextrozoxane is going to be the antidote for the uh, anthracyclines. Um, really any of them. Yeah, and you'll find that different uh, places will have uh, guidelines to say how long a patient will be considered contaminated. So maybe 24 hours, maybe 48 hours, depends on the regimen that they're actually receiving there. Yep. Okay, uh, and then we have our camptothecans. This includes topotecan and irinotecan, and these are going to be inhibiting topoisomerase 1, but again, just know in general it's a topoisomerase inhibitor. Um, again, this is interesting because um, what you'll find is that these tend to cause a... Uh, they inhibit the activity of 
acetylcholinesterase. If you remember, acetylcholinesterase does what? Breaks down acetylcholine, right? So if I inhibit that enzyme, my acetylcholine levels are going to go up, and that's going to cause what? What type of symptoms do I expect? Diarrhea, sweating, those are more globally known as? Dumbbells, right? The dumbbells, which are uh, evidence of what type of receptor activity? Parasympathetic muscarinic, right? So this muscarinic activity is going to go up there, right? So again, we know the dumbbells, and we want to go through the dumbbells. D? Diarrhea. Defecation, diarrhea. Mm -hmm. Urination. Urination. Meiosis. 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 Bradycardia. Bradycardia. Bronchospasm. Bronchorrhea. Emesis first, right? Lacrimation. Could be sweating, but salivation is usually what we think about, right? Yeah, so again, think about they're having a lot of secretions. Um, typically, this does manifest as very severe diarrhea. You're going to be seeing with this, which can be a problem, right? So again, they can see, um, you know, electrolyte disturbances because of that. They become dehydrated because of that. If you guys remember back when we were talking about GI, um, there were some anti-diarrheals we talked about. Anyone remember those drugs? Yeah, there's loperamide and the diphenoxalate was another one. But loperamide is a common one we'll actually give along with uh, irinotecan because we know this, uh, the diarrhea is so severe with that one. We'll go ahead and give them loperamide, try to help to prevent that from occurring there. And remember how that drug worked? Uh, the, <laughs> the receptors, it's an opioid that only yeah. works on the GI receptors. So. Well, it, uh, you're right, it does work on the GI opioid receptors, but it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, remember, so that's why it doesn't, so it potentially could interact with the ones in the spinal cord and the brain, but it just can't get across that blood-brain barrier. Um, yeah, uh, actually, the diphenoxylate is given with the atropine. It prevents IV administration. Yeah, so if you ever see that. Yep, very good, very good. Yeah, so you can work on those peripheral opioid receptors to slow down peristalsis, right, so it helps to prevent that diarrhea there. Okay, so those were the, uh, the topoisomerase acting drugs. Now we're going to get into what we call our alkylating agents. When we say alkylating, what do you think that means? So basically these are going to be things that are directly bind to the DNA itself, right? These are going to be directly bind to the nucleotides that are located within the DNA. They're alkylating them, and by doing that, they're going to cause some significant, um, you know, uh, deformation of the DNA. It's going to cause that increase in strand breaks and decrease in the ability for things like DNA polymerase to come in and read that. By causing that damage, eventually it's going to cause apoptosis. Now, which cell cycle do you think is going to be specific for? Because it doesn't really affect the synthesis of the DNA. It doesn't really affect mitosis. Non-specific, absolutely right. So again, it's a bit of a trick question, which I don't ask on tests or anything, but I can ask you right here. It's fine. Um, so yeah, this would be cell cycle non-specific. So you can give them any time, and they're definitely going to be wrecking shop with that DNA. These are very good at helping to kill off those cancer cells, but these are extremely toxic, right? And in fact, some of them uh, have their origins back in World War One. We actually have here mustard gas. Now we'll talk about our, our nitrogen mustards. Um, these are not mustards you'd ever want to put on your hot dogs, unless I guess maybe you had cancer. I don't know, maybe not. Uh, I mean, esophageal cancer, you can treat that with, I don't know. Um, but basically, yeah, mustard gas. I mean, that is uh, basically was used as a chemical warfare agent. Um, and, you know, that has its start as, as a warfare agent that eventually got turned into a chemotherapeutic drug, right? Um, actually, it goes back to uh, Goodman and Gilman's. If you ever look at your syllabus, look at the recommended text, it's like kind of like the pharmacist's Bible, right? So, that's, again, that's um, where they got their start, right, you know, many, many years ago. Anywho, um, so what these are going to do, they're going to covalently bind to these nucleotides, um, and all, they can actually bind some proteins in the cell itself as well. But really, the DNA is where we're going to get the most of our activity here. So by binding them, either they can, and sometimes they can actually bind multiple nucleotides either within the same strand, or sometimes they'll actually bind into the other strand as well. And that causes that deformation, that damage to the DNA to eventually trigger apoptosis there. Again, their cell cycle nonspecific. And overall, their toxicity is pretty severe, so you're going to see a lot of cytotoxicity, a lot of myosuppression. These also tend to be the most mutagenic, so you're going to see likely secondary cancers that can happen from this, right? Um, Tritogenic, carcinogenic, all that stuff. And actually, overall, they tend to cause pulmonary fibrosis as well, okay? So again, it's one thing you'd want to monitor for, look at their PFTs and whatnot. I'll talk about one agent specifically that is more notorious for causing that a little bit later on. So, again, as I mentioned, the nitrogen mustards, you can see here where they would kind of look like where you have the nitrogen mustard coming along and then binding up to the, the actual um, nucleotide itself. So here would be binding up to guanine. By doing that, you can see here I would kind of cause a uh, an, an intra-strand break where it's going to be binding to between two different ones, I guess intra-strand break. Um, uh, cross link there and actually will deform the DNA enough to where DNA polymerase can't come along and read it anymore. Other enzymes can't work on it. So you're going to see us, uh, DNA damage and eventual cell death. Um, now, this one is uh, unique. The first one we're talking about is cyclophosphamide and iphosphamide. 
It's kind of fall into the same category here, these nitrogen mustards. Um, we use these quite frequently for a lot of our uh, pediatric cancers. Um, and so they form a toxic metabolite called acrolein. Now, acrolein is unique because it actually causes a hemorrhagic cystitis. So again, you want to monitor things like urinalysis, look for things like blood, hematuria and whatnot. Um, but what we can do is actually end up giving uh, a drug that's going to help to prevent that. So the antidote we would consider for ifosfamide and cyclophosphamide called mesna. And that's a longer name than that, but mesna is what it's normally called. Mesnax is usually the brand name you're going to see with that. Basically what it does is it will bind to and inactivate that acrolein. Okay? So again, it doesn't do anything to the actual parent drug itself, but it does it, uh, will bind up and, and inactivate that toxic metabolite and hopefully prevent that. Um, another thing you want to do is make sure you're kind of vigorously hydrating these patients. So very frequently they're going to be getting um, uh, hydration orders. Either they'll get pre chemo hydration, they'll get intra chemo hydration, and then sometimes they'll get post chemo hydration as well. So you're kind of pumping these kids full of fluid. Usually not a big problem for pediatrics because, again, they can handle that much fluid in, in general. But sometimes if you have an older patient, renal patients may not be able to handle that. So you've got to be cons uh, considerate of that point. Uh, other things you can see, some CNS toxicity. Um, you're going to see more of this with ifosfamide, but you can develop this encephalopathy. So, again, monitor for mental status changes and whatnot. Um, anyone ever heard of the drug methylene blue? Or mentioned that? You may see some patients getting uh, this with ifosfamide, and actually some uh, evidence that it helps to prevent that encephalopathy. It's kind of a tangent. You don't have to know that for the test or anything. Um, but other thing, alopecia, nausea, vomiting. These uh, alkylating agents tend to be the worst as far as uh, nausea, vomiting goes for the most part. These are very highly metagenic drugs. Uh, next, we have our nitrosyurea. So two in this category include carmistine and then lomastine. Uh, if you ever say BCNU or CCNU, and again, it's nice when the, the abbreviations have something to do with the, the drug name. Usually it has to do with the chemical name itself. But um, this is actually kind of interesting because you'll find that um, carmistine actually comes in this wafer in some cases. And so you may think, well, when the heck would I ever want to use a wafer? It's like eat it or something, you wouldn't want to do that, no. Um, but imagine if you had someone who had a brain tumor, you could actually have someone excise out that tumor there, and then by putting these wafers that are impregnated with a drug and leaving that there in the area, you're able to get some of those residual cells that maybe the surgeon was not able to get out in the first place. By leaving it there, you have a nice kind of long-lasting sort of depot sort of effect to try to get any rid of, the, uh, rid of those uh, extra cells. The benefit there is you limit a lot of that systemic toxicity you would see if I were to give the drug, say, IV, right? So again, that can be one benefit with the dosage form there. It's kind of unique. Do we need this inside? Hmm? Do we leave this yeah, so you could leave that for a period of time. You may have to go back in and then take them out later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and again, oftentimes used to treat a lot of brain cancers because they tend to be very lipophilic and they can cross that blood brain barrier relatively easily. Um, Sometimes, and, and this is actually uh, unique because this is, um, well, I guess not unique, but it's uh, prominent for this, very significant myelosuppression seen with the nitrosyureas. And actually, sometimes it can be fatal. What's interesting is that you can actually find uh, the nadir. What is, anyone know what the nadir is? kind of the lowest point is going to get to, right? So the question is, when do you hit that nadir? Uh, is it very short after you get the drug, or could it be a little bit prolonged? This one is interesting because it actually can be delayed up to four to six weeks. So again, you think, okay, patient looks good, their, uh, their neutrophil count looks good, but then you got to make sure you're watching them for weeks down the road to make sure they don't develop very severe mental suppression that can lead to that infection, right? So you got to be careful with that. And it can last up to two weeks. So uh, this may be a case where you'd want to give something like a colony stimulating factor to try to get those white cells back up. Uh, but being that it's so good at mild suppression, it could be why it's good uh, to help prep for bone marrow transplant, right? So again, you'd want to wipe out all that bone marrow initially before you want to get, you know, you try to get rid of any of those cancerous cells and then give them that transplant. And that way that can then take hold and start the, the process over again, right? These all fall into the alkylating agent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, next up, we have our platinum analogs. These are for patients with like really good insurance, right? Just kidding, no. Um, but they, they definitely do incorporate platinum into, into their chemical structure here. But this includes cisplatin, carboplatin, and oxaloplatin. So if you see the platin in there, you know it means uh, platinum. Um, basically, these are also binding up to the DNA. They're alkylating agents, just like all the rest of them we've been talking about so far. Um, these are also known to cause a lot of significant nephrotoxicity. So these are ones you want to make sure you're hydrating very, very well for the patient. Oftentimes, they're getting liters and liters of fluid. To try to make sure you kind of flush those kidneys out and keep that drug moving along. Um, also unique to this one is going to be the ototoxicity you can see with this, right? So you can be careful of the ototoxicity. What other drugs can cause ototoxicity? Yeah, so uh, furosemide, aminoglycoside, right? So you be careful with those. Imagine you get a patient who's developing an infection. They had to get something like oxaloplatin. You had to give them an aminoglycoside. You can see how they could be synergistic. So you want to monitor for that hearing loss. This is, a, this is not reversible hearing loss, right? Uh, potentially, right? So, yeah. Because I know some of them are reversible. <coughs> 
it, it sometimes it depends on uh, the duration, the dose they're getting, a lot of things. So, so especially if it's more minor, it may be a little bit more reversible, but in some cases it can progress to irreversible. Yep. Um, also, this one's going to cause some peripheral neuropathies. Again, a hand foot sort of uh, configuration there. And then hypersensitivity risk is a big one with this one. Very severe nausea and vomiting. Again, this is another one of the ones that's uh, probably at the top of the list as being the most highly emetogenic out there. Okay. Other alkylators, you have things like decarbazine, timazolamide. Um, these are actually getting metabolized. So these uh, active metabolites are going to be able to, to methylate things like guanine. And again, working the same exact uh, as all the other alkylating agents here. Again, vomiting, alopecia, mild suppression, pretty common what we saw with the rest of the uh, alkylators. Uh, this one uh, is busulfan. This one's actually unique in the fact that it's very much known for causing pulmonary fibrosis. If you look at chemo man, you'll notice he has big, uh, big bees for his lungs. Uh, there's something you have, have that develops called busulfan lung. It's that pulmonary fibrosis thing with that. So again, monitoring PFTs and things like that is good for those patients. Um, but that's one of the things more prominent with busulfan than some of the other ones. Really, any of the alkylators could do pulmonary fibrosis, but this one's the most prominent. Okay, so that's the majority of kind of the, the tried and true old school sort of, of chemotherapeutic agents. Again, know their mechanisms, know their, you know, if they're working on specific cell cycles, uh, cell phases, know where they're working at, know the toxicities, know the antidotes, there's antidotes available. Those are the things I want you to know. I'm not going to ask you which one of these would be best to treat, you know, uh, you know non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. That's not our purpose here, right? We're just going to at least get you some passing familiarity with the chemotherapeutic agents, okay? So getting into some mis Let's talk about some other options that are out there, right? So, for instance, we can use things like androgens and estrogens. Now, we said androgens and estrogens can be potentially what? Carcinogenic, right? So, you can potentially cause cancer. Um, what you're going to find is that in some cases, we can use uh, certain things that can either decrease the production of some of these hormones, or we can do things that can actually antagonize the receptors where those hormones would normally be uh, interacting with, right? And so, different ways we can do that. So, for instance, with like prostate cancer, breast cancer, these tend to be things that be much more hormone sensitive. So by blocking those receptors, you can decrease activity and hopefully decrease that proliferation, right? Because again, talking about urology, which we talked about last semester, what was one of the big things that um, caused the prostate to grow? The hydrotestosterone. So I can get something that blocks the receptor or something that blocked the, the actual production of it, that's going to decrease that cell proliferation. Same thing for breast cancer, endometrial cancer, um, that is more estrogen sensitive, right? We'll talk much more about um, estrogen and, and all that in the ob guide section a little bit later on. Um, Corticosteroids can also be really important here as well, right? This is where we're talking about dextra, uh, dexamethasone, methylprednisolone, all those normal corticosteroids we've talked about. Oftentimes, uh, if you think about corticosteroids, what do they do to normal patients if you give them really high-dose corticosteroids? What is it? It's immunosuppression, right? We can do the same thing here. It can actually suppress that immune system, suppress white blood cell production. So a lot of our patients with leukemia are oftentimes getting things like dexamethasone in addition to their chemotherapeutic agents. So it's going to help to tamp down that production there. Um, so that can be a good thing there. Um, you can actually find that certain corticosteroids are good for anti-emesis, right? So we can sometimes give dexamethasone uh, as part of an anti-emetic regimen. So you may see that occasionally. <laughs> Uh, other hormonal therapies, sometimes you're going to find um, that uh, you know, certain cancers tend to be more sensitive to the hormones uh, than others. You know, it depends on what mutations they have. So especially with like, breast cancer and whatnot, you want to know what type of breast cancer they have, what mutations, because uh, that will guide you to say whether you know, things like um, you know, hormone-based therapies might be better for that patient or, or worse, depending on what kind of mutations they express. Um, as I mentioned, you know, usually with our glucocorticoids, this helps to suppress down things like the white, white blood cells by giving that. And then usually we're going to be giving things like anti-estrogens and anti-androgens, uh, depending on the type of cancer they have. Uh, we'll talk more about the um, uh, things like the SERMs or the selective estrogen receptor modulators. We'll talk about that in the ob section a little bit later on. But just know that this is another component that could be used in addition to more traditional sort of chemotherapy. Right? Okay. And then up next, we have our biologic response. Again, this is the the most kind of um, rapidly changing sort of um, set of drugs here. And again, I'm only going to give you a very brief sort of overview of a few of them just to give you an example of how they're working and why they are different than a lot of our standard uh, sort of chemotherapeutic agents are. are. Um, now, looking at things like protein kinases, if you remember when we, way back in the intro to farm course, we talked about the different receptor types. Remember the tyrosine kinase? Where that those receptors well that's uh, one of the things we can really target there's a lot of different ones that are expressed in, in the body certain cancers are more likely to express certain ones 
these cases, and we can actually target that very specifically. And oftentimes, these tyrosine kinases tend to um, promote things like growth, right? They tend to cause um, uh, growth of cells, cell proliferation. Um, you can see this with things like insulin receptors. You can see things like platelet drive. Uh, growth factor, lots of different ones. And if a cancerous cell expresses one particular one, either through mutation or otherwise, we can target that and be much more specific for affecting just that particular cell instead of getting all the other healthy cells around it. So it's much more targeted, much less toxicity you're going to see with that one. Okay, These are just some examples of ones we may be, be targeting. And again, here's that tyrosine kinase receptor, as we mentioned. Um, again, insulin receptors are a really good example of ones that, that work through this pathway. But again, once they get phosphorylated, that's when they're going to start to have their cellular response. So if I can inhibit this, I can do something to block up that receptor, then I never have that cellular response. That proliferation never happens there. So it can be a very powerful um, uh, inhibitor to producing more of those cells. You can see it gets very complicated as far as um, the downstream effects that, that occur here. So again, if I can block it off at the top of the pyramid, that's going to be very, very powerful to help to block further progression and proliferation of those cells. So just to give you a few examples, so uh, one of the kind of big ticket ones uh, early on was called imatinib or Gleevec. And so this was good for patients with uh, CML or CMML, but they had to have these very specific mutations. So if you had this BCR able mutation, then this drug would work for those patients. You'd find that you decrease these uh, tyrosine kinases uh, that were responsible for that cell proliferation um, and, and really decrease the, the number of cells that they were producing. Very, very powerful, very curative for a lot of those patients. If you didn't have that mutation, though, then you couldn't get the drug. So, again, it's one of those things where, um, you know, just by luck of the draw or by whatever the case may be, like you either had it or you didn't, and that dictated what kind of therapy you would get. And, again, looking at the side effect profile, nausea, vomiting, a little bit of edema, Pretty nice compared to all the mild suppression, the GI effects, all that stuff with the traditional chemotherapy. So very nice from that standpoint. Another one uh, was, is called a Jafitinib. This was good for non-small cell lung cancer. This is attacking this ERV1 or the HER1 um, receptors there. So again, just to give you an example how this is much more targeted, much less side effects as opposed to your traditional chemotherapy that was very non-selective. Um, not necessarily. With the ones that are more protein-based, like the uh, national monoclonal antibodies, those tend to be a lot more expensive. Um, these probably are more expensive just because they're a little bit newer. You know, things like cyclophosphamide and methotrexate, stuff that's older than dirt. It's been around forever. Like, that stuff's pretty cheap just in general. It's probably a little bit more expensive. As I mentioned, antibodies, you're going to find that these are um, good for shooting for specific cell targets, um, either for certain CD receptors that may be expressing, things like that. So things like rituximab, alentuzumab, um, you know you know how to recognize a monoclonal antibody just based off of the name. Um, but again, when you are giving these, especially ones that may be affecting the immune system, what are something you have to worry about? Oh, sure, anaphylaxis is a big one. What else? Think about the immunosuppression, right? Think about things like, you know, hey, do I need to check for TB before I give this drug, right? A lot of those that suppress the immune system tend to maybe uh, cause a, maybe a latent reactivation uh, of that. Careful with that one. Um, just as, a, as an example, rituximab binds to CD20 on B lymphocytes. What they find is in 90% uh, of cases of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, they express that CD20 antigen. So if you have that, you can give rituximab. It's going to bind up that CD20 receptor, and then your immune system will come along and then target that, that antibody and then gobble up that cell, basically, right, and help you to get rid of it. Um, and so, again, not only that, but it helps to regulate that uh, cell cycle activation. So you block it up from that standpoint, in addition to the fact that you uh, will start to activate that complement system and help to get rid of that cell. So again, very specific, very targeted for just that particular cancer cell, spares everything else, which is nice. And again, toxicity, usually you're going to find, because it's a protein-based product, a lot of infusion-related reactions, you know, you get those uh, arthralgias, the fever associated with that, um, things like urticaria, bronchospasm, you know, so there is some risk for anaphylactoid-like reactions, especially with rituximab. The X means it's chimeric which means it contains both human and mouse protein or murine protein. Um, Any time you get more, uh, you get farther away from just human proteins, more likely you are to see those reactions. So for instance, rituximab is going to be a lot worse for that than some of the other ones we'll see in just a uh, moment here. You have very mild, mild suppression, but not anything as severe as what you would see with uh, something like, you know, cisplatin or something like that. Uh, trastuzumab is one, uh, Herceptin is the, the brand name here. This one is going to be uh, targeting this HER2 receptor. And so you tend to find this on uh, metastatic breast cancers. And so again, if they are expressing this HER2 oncogene, this is going to be a drug that can directly target that, right? So again, depending on the morphology of the, that, uh, the mutations that cancer is expressing can dictate whether you're getting specific drugs or not, right? So again, very targeted.
Oftentimes you're going to be using these in addition to other traditional chemotherapies. So for instance, you can use this with doxorubicin and uh, taxol. Again, doxorubicin being an anthracycline and then taxol being one that's affecting the microtubules, right? So again, getting synergy by targeting different uh, steps of the process here. Um, you're able to get a lot of synergy here and have to get rid of a lot of those cancer cells. And again, notice here, very... Uh, not so far, not bad as far as toxicity goes. Um, with trastuzumab, you do have to worry about this cardiomyopathy. However, the question is, if you're giving it with doxorubicin, where is that that can cause that anyway? So it's a question of the chicken or egg sort of thing. Maybe this is kind of helping it along a little bit. And then we also have what we call immunotherapy. So immunotherapy just basically means we're giving something to try to stimulate the host's own immune system to target these cells, right? Target these cells that need to be gotten rid of. Um, and so basically, there's a couple different... Uh, these are include things like interferon, We'll talk about interferons used in several other um, different disease states. We'll talk about it when we talk about um, MS briefly, and then we'll talk about it when we talk about um, uh, hepatitis. Talk about uh, interferon being used here. These are very nasty drugs because, again, you're kind of ramping up the host's own immune system. There's a lot of side effects associated with it, but it could be nice uh, if it helps to, to get rid of that cancer there. Basically, what you're going to find, you know, lots of different types of cancer can be used to treat here, but again, uh, hepatitis is probably the more common thing you're going to see it being used for. Um, but again, it's a, it's a protein, so it's very expensive to make. Uh, it's also got a risk of having anaphylaxis associated with it, especially because even though it's human recombinant, it's actually made in E. coli, so there's still a little bit of that foreign protein is going to be involved with that. Um, effects really really nasty from that standpoint obviously if you're ramping up your immune system you're going to feel like you're sick you know, the flu-like sort of effects there but what's interesting is that interferon can also cause a lot of mood changes to occur as well the patients tend to get a lot more uh, a lot more cranky um, get uh, you know more agitated they just don't really feel very good um, I had uh, one patient who had hepatitis C was on interferon and his wife was like oh yeah he's got interferon brain just can't even deal with him right now just gotta let him just be mad and cranky and just know it's not me, him, and, and you know, uh, just deal with it, right? Um, so you got to be careful with that one, you know, worse than depression, etc. So not, not a great drug. If you can avoid it, it's always good. Okay, so this is the majority of the drugs you may run into. And again, those miscellaneous agents, I just want to kind of give you just a kind of a brief exposure to like, here's the different ways you can potentially treat the cancer. Um, but really the tried and true ones are those ones I want you to really kind of focus in on as far as mechanisms go, um, interactions, potentially if there are any antidotes, et cetera, okay? Um, going into some of the kind of ancillary things here just to finish up, um, would you, as I mentioned, a lot of these regimens are going to be count dependent, meaning you need to look at things like the, the platelet count. You need to look at things like the white cell count, namely the neutrophils. You're going to look at what we call the absolute neutrophil count to make sure those have recovered. If not, then you have to worry about um, waiting to give the, you know, waiting another week or so for those uh, counts to, to recover there. Um, also, you got to monitor for organ function. Look at things like urinalysis. Look at renal function, hepatic function. Very important to look at from all those standpoints. And when you're looking at how the drug is being dosed, and this is actually going to be very pertinent to your uh, prescription assignment, how are we actually dosing these drugs here, right? So again, we talked about different dosing strategies. We talked about age-based dosing. That's okay. Uh, oftentimes, you're going to find that you know kids uh, and even adults may be uh, various sizes for a given age may not be the most dosing appropriate. Um, you know, things like weight base is, is okay. But when I say BSA, what does that mean? Body surface area. What does that take into account? High and weight, right? So what you're going to find is we oftentimes look at the, the BSA, and most chemotherapeutic agents tend to be dosed based off of BSA. At least most of the, the tried and true traditional ones uh, are going to be based off of BSA. There can be some inconsistencies there, because if you look at BSA uh, calculators, you're going to find there's several different varieties that are out there. So when you look at the prescription assignment, make special note of the equation I tell you to use, because that's going to affect your dosing. Hint, hint, hint. Look at that. Look at all your units. Make sure everything is consistent, right? So BSA is very good because even if you have a patient who has a significant change in weight, because um, again, how do you might, where do you think the patient's weight might go once they're receiving chemotherapy, up or down? down. Probably down, right? Because again, they're sick, they they feel nauseous all the time, they're not going to want to eat, they're having a lot of vomiting, diarrhea, like yeah, typically the weight goes down. You have to monitor for that, right? But because their height isn't usually isn't changing all that too much, or so for peds and for adults, uh, the BSA doesn't change all that much, and so based off of that, uh, that's why we dose a lot of that off uh, off of BSA exact sort of uh, dosing there. Uh, as I mentioned, with safety and handling, proper PPE is super, super important. This is going to be more um, important for, say, like the nursing staff or administering the drugs than you necessarily, but you're going to be examining the patients, you're going to be laying hands on them, you need to be aware if they're contaminated or not. So that means including things like gloves, gowns, even shoe covers. You know, if you get some chemo that lands on your shoe, that's going to be stuck there for a while and you can potentially transfer that uh, elsewhere. Um, if you're ever worried about aerosolization of the drugs itself, you want to make sure you're wearing a face mask. Uh, make sure you're not going to be breathing any of that in. You're getting into the eyes.
as I mentioned, the excretions from the patient tend to be contaminated for a period of time. Depends on the chemo that you're dealing with. If it has a longer half-life, the excretions are going to be contaminated for a longer period of time. So there'll, there'll be guidelines out there that will tell you how long to consider that. But this is where you think about blood samples, you think about diapers, et cetera, um, can be potentially sources for contamination, right? Because again, you don't want that exposure because that can be carcinogenic to you as a otherwise healthy individual, right? Okay. Other supportive care things from a hematologic standpoint, as I mentioned, mild suppression is one of the most common life-threatening sort of uh, side effects you can see with these drugs here. And so what we can sometimes do is we can give them colony stimulating factors. We can give them drugs to try to stimulate their own white cells to start to reproduce, uh, white cells and also things like uh, the platelets to start to reproduce. Um, and so depending on where in the cycle you need that stimulation, you can give them different drugs. So for instance, you have something, if you just need erythropoietin, we talked about that uh, when we talked about nephro, right? We talked about in chronic kidney disease, oftentimes they need erythropoietin because their kidneys aren't really making it anymore. This, we're going to be focusing more on the colony stimulating factors for the um, granulocyte uh, macrophages. We're going to be focusing more on these to try to get um, your neutrophils back up. We're going to be focusing on to get your platelets back up as well. As I mentioned, when these levels are down, you're increased risk for anemia, uh, bleeding, uh, infection. So these are things we want to uh, watch out for there. Okay. As I mentioned, don't use the rectal administration in any neutropenic patient uh, because, again, if you have any translocation of those bacteria, that's not going to be good. You can develop a bloodstream infection from that, right? And then, in fact, even things like, you know, you can't deliver fresh flowers to a patient who's actively receiving chemotherapy because there's all kinds of little bacteria and bugs living on the flowers, right? Um, you don't want them to have any um, fruit that doesn't require peeling. Like an orange would be okay, a banana would be okay, but you don't want them to chow down on, like, some strawberries, because again, they can harbor bacteria and whatnot. Okay, so little things you might not think about um, because of their immunosuppression, you have to take extra special care uh, to avoid them having unnecessary bacterial exposures. And again, um, either we can correct these with either time to give them time to recover on their own, um, or we can either give them replacements potentially if they need a PRBCs or if they need a platelet a transfusion or by giving these stimulating factors. From a GI standpoint, as I mentioned, nausea vomiting is very, very common. Some drugs are much more likely to cause it than others, so and sometimes even dose-related. But a lot of your alkylating agents can be very, very metagenic um, from that standpoint. And again, we talked about antimedics already. So what are some different options we would use? Zofran, which is uh, what kind of drug? Serotonin antagonist, right? What else? Metoclopramide. Metoclopramide or Reglan. Actually, it was interesting. I talked to a Hemont pharmacist uh, a long time ago, and she was saying that back before Zofran came around, Zofran was like a godsend uh, from, from that standpoint for chemo patients because if you look at Reglan, and we'll talk about this when we get into um, uh, the psych section a little bit later on, but one of the ways that dopamine or that metoclopramide worked was by blocking dopamine. Well, what does these say also has a lack of dopamine as its main feature? Parkinson's, right? So you'd have these chemo patients who were having just terrible nausea and vomiting. Reglan was really like the best drug they had at the time. You're having to give them really high doses of Reglan to help deal with that nausea and vomiting. Well, now they're developing all these extra pyramidal side effects, which is a big component uh, of those drugs there, as we'll see when we get, talk about uh, psych later on. And so they were developing this tardive dyskinesia, this EPS. It was very, very distressing to the patient, but they weren't throwing up. So it's like one of those things where it's like, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, when Zofran came along, that really changed the 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 game a lot, and so they were able to take that drug with relatively few side effects, another thing long term, uh, and they had, had much better results from that. So that's a really good uh, option for them. So Zofran, you have metoclopramide or Reglan, what else? Anticholinergics are sometimes used. What else? A prepotent is a good one. Yeah, it's a substance P receptor antagonist, right? So again, that's a very good one. We we'll use for really the highest emetogenic drugs. In fact, uh, prepotent is uh, almost exclusively used just in the, in the case of chemo-related uh, nausea and vomiting. Well, what about a patient who is coming in there having that anticipatory nausea and vomiting we talked about? Hmm? Anti-anxiety, all right? So that anxiety is one of the things that ramping them up. What could I give them for anxiety? Lorazepam, yeah. So we'll talk about that later in the psych section, but we'll actually give them a benzodiazepine or a drug usually used for anxiety or for seizures to try to calm them down. That's going to help to deal with a lot of that anticipatory nausea vomiting. So oftentimes there's multiple drugs you're getting. Also think about your corticosteroids are being good for nausea vomiting as well. So it's not uncommon. Someone's getting like cisplatin, um, cyclophosphamide. They may have lorazepam, uh, Benadryl as an anticholinergic. They may have dexamethasone. Uh, Zofran, they have just a whole litany of drugs they're beginning just for that nausea and vomiting because it is so severe, right? So again, it's a big thing to consider. Other things, uh, the mucositis, very, very painful, right? So again, if everyone's ever had like a canker sore or anything like that, like can be pretty problematic for them, especially from a, uh, just even getting nutrition in, even drinking, um, it can be very difficult to swallow for those patients. So um, also by having that epithelial tissue being disrupted, 
And again, everyone's mouth is pretty dirty. You end up seeing infection from that as well. Uh, so you need to have good oral hygiene. This includes things like salt rinses and a, a drug called chlorhexidine or Peridex is a, a good antiseptic sort of agent. We'll give them, we'll have them kind of swish in their mouth and hopefully uh, try to get rid of any of those bugs there. Uh, so it's one thing to consider. And sometimes we even have patients who have such poor oral intake, you actually have to give them total parental nutrition and nutrition through an IV because of that. So it can be pretty severe. Just to give you an idea of some of the, um, the metagenic potential of some of these chemotherapeutic regimens. So here's like the high risk ones. We're greater than 90% frequency without antiemetics. You're almost guaranteed to throw up receiving one of these drugs. And so things like cyclophosphamide, uh, things like cisplatin, um, ifosfamide, you know, these are things that are going to be very, very highly metagenic. Don't memorize the slide. But just know that it's a spectrum, right? And so, again, um, the, when you see the regimen, you're like, well, how come this drug only needed to have uh, so, for instance, like a good example, if the patient's only getting vincristine that day, they may only need a little bit of Zofrid. Vincristine is not really that bad from a nausea vomiting standpoint. However, if they're getting cisplatin, they're going to be getting a whole like four or five drugs for that. So, again, just be aware of that. That's why that difference is there. It's because, again, they're not all equal as far as the metagenicity goes. Um, other things, the alopecia, we can't really do a whole lot with that. Um, you know, it's pretty distressing for the patient. Not a whole lot we can do. It's also distressing because sometimes when the hair does grow back after they receive the chemotherapy, sometimes it will change sort of like texture a little bit, maybe either wavy or straighter than it was before, um, which can be kind of problematic for them. Um, but again, nothing a whole lot we can do for that, right? Um, and again, over the long run, probably the thing that we care the least about, even though it's probably something that's like a huge deal for them, right? Um, and then the extravasation, you have to be really, really careful with this. Um, so make sure they have good IV access. Potentially, a lot of these patients getting recurrent chemotherapy will have ports that are placed, so that way they have good central access access uh, for that, but um, anthracyclines, vinc alkaloids, ataxines are all really the worst when it comes to the vesication there. Just be aware that there's going to be different um, uh, regimens are out there for every drug. You need to consult that if you were to have an, an, an incident occur. Sometimes we'll get what we call hyaluronidase. It actually helps to dis um, break down some of this uh, connective tissue, um, and that helps uh, uh, aid the absorption a little bit better. So sometimes you'll see that. Anyone ever heard of the term hypodermoclysis? You know what that is? It's actually subcutaneous fluid administration. Sometimes we'll actually give uh, patients hyaluronidase. We'll inject it in the back, um, similar to like, you know, when you ever take your animal to the vet, like if you give a, like a dog or cat to the vet and they want to give them fluids, they give it, they do uh, hypodermoclysis, right? If they're giving it subcutaneously, we can do that to people too. If we can get IV access, so we'll kind of give them like a little camel hump. Um, we inject this, but the hyaluronidase breaks down that sub -connect, uh, subcutaneous connective tissue and allows the, the skin to hold on to more volume. I mean, you can do whole fluid boluses in there. It's no problem. You do a whole liter. So it's kind of interesting. So that's it for this section. Glad I was able to get it through in the two-hour time frame. Any questions so far? Let me check out the sticky board, see what's there.